Hello and welcome to RAP Lecture 10, Oops, the finale. So this will be on power amplifiers and other related topics, as we'll see. So um, we'll leave the power amplifier stuff towards the middle to end. First, we're going to talk about some notation, and we'll see that shortly. Um, how we define power in the power amplifier, like how much power are we talking? That's kind of an important quantity to quantify. And then we'll get into all the power amplifier stuff, which will be kind of exciting, I hope. Um, we'll talk about class A amplifier mostly, and you might have seen the class A amplifier in your circuits classes, but this will be an RF class A amplifier, which is a little different than to the conventional stuff you see in low frequencies. So first the notation, we gotta talk about decibels because you always see them when you're talking RF and power. So uh, first we have the dB itself. And I'm sure you, you know that dB is a ratio between two quantities. And those two quantities are always power, not voltage or current, um, but power. So, you, you know, when you take dB of, you know, the voltage gain of an amplifier, you're really doing the voltage squared, not voltage itself. And that's where the two comes from. You know, you do 20 log 10 of a voltage, not 10 log 10. So you're squaring the voltage and the square comes out of the logarithm. So you get the two. Anyway, um, and then dBm, that's when you're talking absolute power. Not, not just a ratio of two power quantities. So with dBm, the, the quantity you're taking the ratio with respect to is one milliwatt. So dBm is in fact absolute power, unlike dB. So here I have an example, we have 0.5 volts amplitude across a 50 ohm load. So 0.5 squared um, divided by 50 divided by two. Remember because, let me, let me write this out. This, this, this point will be very important later. So if we have the power of a DC quantity, we have V times I, right? That's straightforward. Power of an AC quantity, and I'm sure you've seen this before, is one half times the amplitude of V times the amplitude of I. And if they're out of phase, you have to add the, you know, the cosine of the phase shift between them. But if we assume they're in phase, then it's just one half V times I. Right, so we get two and a half milliwatts here, and then 10 log 10 of 2.5 is um, minus 26. And then you have to add 30 to get to dBm, so it becomes four dBm. And then similarly, if we have 0.7 volts across a 50 ohm load, it gets you 4.9 milliwatts. You do 10 log 10 of 4.9, add 30, and you get 6.9 dBm. Um, and then, of course, there's also dBW, which is the same as dBm, except you're taking power with respect, you're taking a ratio with respect to one watt, right? So all, all of that's fairly straightforward, I hope. Um, but the key here is this line that's underlined. If, you, if somebody gives you voltage, but not the current, or somebody gives you the voltage and not the load, you can't determine what the power is, right? So you could have you know, 100 volts amplitude and zero current and you have no power. Um, so uh, the, the key is that you need both voltage and current to get power. Um, and then if you have voltage in the load, you can of course determine the current, you know, use Ohm's law or whatever, and you can get power, but you can't have one without the other. So, the, the confusing thing, though, is that people in the RF community like to assume that there's a 50 ohm load. Um, and so they just give you, you know, a voltage, you assume there's a 50 ohm load, and you can compute power from that. But not always. So you, it really depends on context, and you got to use some intuition to determine what's what. So for example, when, uh, when, when you buy a mixer uh, from a manufacturer, they might say it's rated for a 7 dBm LO drive level. And that 7 dBm is assuming you have a 50 ohm load. 
So you have 7 dBm into that 50 ohm load. However, the, as we've seen before, the LO port on a, say a diode ring mixer is not 50 ohms. I mean, it might be 50 ohms at a certain drive level, but at 7 dBm, it's not gonna be exactly 50. And of course it's a nonlinear quantity. So as you change uh, your amplitude, the actual impedance is gonna change and gets messy, but it's not 50. However, the assumption you're making when they tell you 7 dBm is that the mixer looks like 50 ohms. So your amplifier that's uh, driving the LO input of the mixer should uh, drive it like it's 50 ohms. And the power that's going into it, should it be 50 ohms, should be 7 dBm but it's not, so the power will be a little different. And I, I write here, oops, use intuition. Um, and that, that just takes experience, I guess. So in, the, uh, in order to go through this quickly, I'll just leave this up here for a little moment. Um, I think these are pretty self-explanatory. You know, you multiply power by 10 in linear scale, you add 10 dB and so on. So we'll leave that in there for reference if you wanna go back to it. Here's a nice little example. So we wanna transmit 13 dBm into an antenna and the antenna is gonna look like 50 ohms. So here's the interactive part. Uh, so can one of our participants say what 13 dBm is in terms of linear scale power? Okay, so first you have to subtract 30. Are, are we on the right track? Uh, well, you can do it directly in terms of milliwatts. Ah, uh, okay. So you divide it by 10 and raise it and take 10 to the power of that, right? Um, yeah, so that, that'd be one way to do it. So what would, what would that have come out to? My calculator says that is close to 20 um, milliwatts. Uh, it's, it's more than close. It's exactly 20 milliwatts. Or I should, okay. shouldn't say exactly, but very close to it. Yeah, um, okay. So the, the way I would do it, that's one way to do it. The way I do it is you start from 0 dBm. So 0 dBm is 1 milliwatt. Then we go to 10 dBm. Oh, sorry, 10. 10 dBm is 10 milliwatts, right? And then we add another three to get 13. Remember adding three in dB scale is just multiplying by two and we get 20 milliwatts. And you're right, it's not exactly 20, but it's pretty darn close. Okay, so next, so we have 20 milliwatts into the 50 ohms. What would the voltage across that be? Oh yeah catching up with the adding the three thing. Okay. Okay, so we have 20 milliwatts over 50 ohms. What, what did you ask? What, what would the voltage across, or the voltage amplitude across the 50 ohm load be? Well, um, we divide the power by the resistance and take this square root. Wait, no, no, no. We, you yeah, tell we me what equation you'd use. Uh, power is equal to voltage squared over R. Okay, so you missed one thing. 2R? Yeah. Um, I, I guess it didn't specify that this is AC, not DC, but yeah. Um, oh, okay. Uh, um, yeah, cool. So 2R and then, so V would be. Uh, root square root of two. Yeah. Um, let's see if I can actually look at this. <laughs> um, I'm, I don't think so. So P is, 0.02, right? Times two is 0.04, and then times 50 is, um, oh, you're right. Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Now current, 
that, that can easily be found from the voltage, right? Right. So that would be? That would be over R, which is uh, okay. square root of two over 50. Right. Okay. So that's fun. On to why we need power. So <clears throat> right here in the audio world, you have power amplifiers. Um, and those power amplifiers are driving speakers. So you might have you know, your audio receiver that uh, is powering your little uh, home theater system. And you know, some of those speakers take uh, you know, 100 watts or something. And that's a lot of power. So the key in the audio world is that you want your amplifiers to be as linear as possible to minimize any distortion because somehow people hear the, the smallest amounts of distortion in audio amplifiers because uh, they have magical ears. Um, and then obt obtaining that linearity is, is not easy when you're working with lots of power. And so that's why the design of those, at at, they tend to be kind of critical. Um, at the, on the RF side, you know, we worked with mixers, passive mixers specifically, so you know the diode ring mixer. And for passive mixers, you usually need to have a high LO power to turn those diodes on and off. You know, those diodes end up looking like shorts when they're completely on. And so that's gonna consume a lot of power from your LO. Um, and so, you know, sometimes you, you have mixers that require 7 dBm LO power, sometimes it's 13, sometimes it's 21. Uh, and as it gets higher and higher, it becomes harder and harder. But that's just one example. Another one is when we're actually transmitting a signal, um, you know, from an antenna. Uh, when we, at the receiver side, we want to receive as much power as possible in order to maximize uh, the SNR at the receiver, you know, the signal to noise ratio. So usually the more power, the better up till a certain point, you know, there's limits that the FCC puts in place. Um, you have power limitations on your actual device, right? Because you know sometimes you have a device powered by a battery and you don't want to consume that much power. But in general, you're transmitting a substantial amount of power. And we'll, we'll see how much that is shortly. But in, in wireless communications, what we're often uh, uh, concerned with is how much power is being attenuated from the transmitter to the receiver. And so you can quantify that uh, in the ideal case with something called the freeze transmission equation. So, uh, and you know, you remember from your physics, physics classes that if you have an electromagnetic wave, the power contained within you know, a spherical shell uh, as it travels outwards is always the same, right? But in a, in a a fixed amount of area in those spherically propagating shells, a fixed amount of area will have a, a power that'll drop as a square of the distance from the source, right? So you know you have your antenna, your transmitter antenna, it's sending out signals, and you know you're some distance d away from the antenna, and the power will drop as one over. That doesn't look like a one. It will drop as one over d squared, right? And that's just a property of your, you know, uh, radiation in all directions. So uh, we can we can you know analytically determine how much power a receiver that's a distance d away from the transmitter will see, uh, given the frequency of the transmission, as well as the properties of the antennas that are being used on the transmitter and receiver. And so that's all contained in this equation right here. So this is saying the ratio of the received power to the transmitted power is equal to these constants gt and gr times this quantity here, uh, lambda over four pi d, all, all squared. So lambda, of course, is the wavelength, and d is the distance between the transmitter and receiver, and it's squared. 
Um, the reason why there's a lamp in here is has to do with the antennas uh, and these two quantities here. And I, I won't really get into that because that's beyond the scope of this particular presentation. But if you go into antennas, you'll figure that one out. Uh, so specifically G and GT and GR are the transmitter and receiver antenna gains. So if you have an omnidirectional antenna, these quantities are just one or close to one at least. Um, sometimes they're a little smaller than one due to loss in the antenna. Uh, but if they're omnidirectional, which no antenna truly is, uh, you can they, they, they're one. Uh, for our cases though, we can approximate them as one, though they're not really one. Um, so we have a nice example here of how to use this thing. So suppose we're at 27 megahertz, like we always are, and we want to transmit across one kilometer. So, you know, a little, little more than half a mile, I suppose. And so we want to know what's the ratio of the received power to the transmitted power. So with 27 megahertz, lambda, that's speed of light over frequency is just 11.1 .1 meters. And so you plug that into the equation and you get 7.8 times 10 to the minus seven, which is minus 61 dB. Right, notice we're using dB because we're taking the ratio between two powers. So it's just 10 log 10 of this quantity here. And that's a lot, right? So if you're transmitting say one milliwatt, you have to subtract 61 dB from that, and you get minus 61 dBm. And that's 78 nanowatts. So you basically lost six orders of magnitude of power uh, when you're transmitting across a one kilometer distance at 27 megahertz. So that kind of sucks. Uh, <laughs> it gets even worse when we're talking about satellite communication. So for example, with GPS, the satellites are about 20,200 kilometers above the surface of Earth and they transmit at roughly 1.6 gigahertz. It's actually a little below that, it's like 1.5 something. But if we take 1.6, wavelength is 0.19 meters, or 19 centimeters. And if you plug all of this into the equation, assuming that GT and GR are one, then we get minus 183 dB. So, you know, 19 orders of magnitude. Um, that's no bueno. So, the assumption that GT and GR are one is not good for this particular GPS example, because GPS antennas um, actually have high gain. So what that means is that they're essentially focusing, instead of radiating in all directions, the satellites are focusing um, energy towards Earth instead of you know radiating into space, because that would be a waste of energy. So what that does is that that increases this number. Um, in the case of GPS, I believe it's around uh, 13 dB or so uh, for GT, and then GR depends on your receive antenna. But if we assume GT is equal to GR, then the actual figure for this PR over PT comes out to minus 157, which is still horrible, right? Because <laughs> you're losing um, you know, around 16 orders of magnitude of power going from transmitter to receiver. So the, the gist of this is that transmitting at high powers becomes very important, especially depending on your particular application. So to give you a scale of what power is what, I have a nice chart here. So at the low end, we have Bluetooth. The lowest low end is Bluetooth low energy, where that's the low power version of Bluetooth. And it has a maximum transmit power of 10 dBm. So that's 10 milliwatts. So that's not a lot of power, right? But remember Bluetooth is only transmitting over a short range and it only transmits at a low data rate or relatively low. And then if we go one step up, we get to the cell phone. Um, and here we're talking, you know, 20 to 30 dBm. So that's around, uh, you know, 100 milliwatts to a watt of power that a cell phone's transmitting to a base station. Okay, we're, we're stepping up. Then we get to the GPS satellite. GPS is transmitting at 44 dBm. And if you 
remember your little DB uh, tricks. Remember, 40 dBm is 10 to the fourth milliwatts, right? So 40, uh, 40 dBm is just one or 10 watts, right? We add three to get the 43 dBm. So this is 40. 43 is uh, 20 watts. And then we have to add an extra dB to get to 44 dB. And, and that comes out to around 25, oops, 25 watts. So not a whole lot of power in the grand scheme of things, but satellites are uh, usually very constrained in terms of how much power they can use, right? Because their power is basically coming from solar panels. And so they have to conserve that. But 25 watts is way more than what a cell phone's putting out. And then we get to the humongous, uh, <laughs> this is called the Precision Acquisition Vehicle Entry Phased Array Warning System, or PAVE pause. And this is a, a radar that the US created during the Cold War. And it uh, was used, I guess uh, some of them are currently being used to serve as an early warning system for ICBMs coming from the Soviet Union or something. But anyway, they're putting out at a peak 88 dBm. That's around 580 kilowatts. And you can see that that is way more than everything else here. And so the power amplifiers used in these uh, radar antennas are pretty beefy. Um, they, they, they also use something called spatial combining where they basically have a bunch of antennas and each one is transmitting at a few hundred watts, but the combined power from all of these antennas makes up this 580 kilowatts. So each individual of, power wow. amplifier only needs to you know, produce a couple hundred watts, but combined, it's a lot of power. Um, so clearly what, what I'm trying to uh, demonstrate by all of this is that your definition of power uh, vastly depends on what application you're talking about from your, your little Bluetooths to your uh, humongous radar systems. Uh, but in general, what you have to consider when you're talking power is that A, devices are getting hot because they have to put out a lot of power and things aren't 100% efficient, so they must burn some of that power as well as heat. And so because of that, efficiency is a big concern. And the other thing is in order to achieve efficiency, high efficiency, which we'll see, we have to enter uh, the nonlinear region of devices, um, which is something you just can't get around usually. And we'll see how that comes about. So any questions on all that? Okay. Well, so uh, the, the following discussions will kind of be oriented around this example. So the example is we have a mixer or uh, you know some device, maybe it's an antenna, but suppose it's a mixer. We wanna derive the LO port at 10 dBm. You know, this might be Bluetooth, for example, in which case you're transmitting 10 dBm. And we're gonna assume that we're trying to drive it into a 50 ohm load. So no weird nonlinear loads or anything, just 50 ohms. And if you go through the math, you know, 10 milliwatts into 50 ohms, you have one volt amplitude and 20 milliamps uh, amplitude current. And we're gonna do this at 27 megahertz. So, Initially, you might think, okay, let's use a common collector amplifier, right? Because remember, common collector amplifiers have low output impedance. They typically have high input impedance. Um, and, you know, at low frequencies, we might use them to drive, say, a speaker or something, uh, because speakers are low impedance. So you need a low output impedance amplifier in order to not sacrifice a bunch of gain. So let's try that. So suppose we bias the transistor to five milliamps current, and we're gonna set the emitter uh, voltage, you know, the DC emitter voltage right here 
we're going to set that to two and a half volts such that it sits halfway between VCC, which is five volts and ground. Right, that, that's been our usual strategy. And so let's try that and see what happens. All right, we can do some calculations too. So if you recall, the voltage gain of a common collector amplifier is given by this quantity here, which is approximately the one over here. Um, but remember with common collector amplifiers, the gain is never greater than one. It's always less than one. Um, but because we made the current five milliamps, this one over a uh, GM, remember GM is equal to IC over VT, the collector current over the thermal voltage. And the thermal voltage is 0.0259, right? So in this case, because the current's five milliamps, uh, GM comes out to be uh, roughly uh, eight millisiemens. And one over eight millisiemens is a small number compared to 500 ohms, which is RE in this case. Um, and right, why 500? Because uh, 2.5 volts divided by 500 is 5 milliamps. Okay, actually, sorry, this is not eight. This is um, 200, roughly 200 millisiemens. And if you go through the actual uh, calculations, you get one over GM is 5.2 here. But anyway, well, the, the gist of this is that the voltage gain is basically one, so 0.99. If you look at the output impedance, it comes out to roughly 5.1 ohms. So you might think 5.1 ohms driving a 50 ohm load, that's not too bad, right? Because you, know, you have your voltage division between the 5.1 and 50, and you, know, you get 50 over uh, 5.1 plus 50. And well, that's, that's like around 0.9, which is close enough to one to not cause a problem, right? Well, let's see what the problem is because clearly <laughs> there is one. So if you strap on your 50 ohm load, you know, use your AC coupling capacitor, of course, to not upset the DC bias, uh, we got a problem. So if we look at the voltage waveform across this 50 ohm load, which is the one on the bottom, you can see the positive portion of your sinusoid looks fine, but the negative one gets clipped off right here. And the reason it's getting clipped off will be apparent if you look at the collector current going into the transistor you see it's also getting clipped off, but at a very particular value, which is zero. And the reason that is, is um, in order to get a perfect sinusoid on the output, the transistor is going to have to have a current that is also sinusoidal. And this current is large enough that it's going to try to go negative but a transistor is not gonna conduct in the negative direction. So it gets clipped off when it tries to go down to zero. And so that's why the voltage gets clipped off. So that's a problem, right? So the solution is you just have to bias the transistor at a higher current. So we know that the, the current swing into the 50 ohm load has to be plus or minus 20 milliamps, right? Because we wanted a 10 milliwatt power going into the 50 ohm load. So plus or minus 20 milliamps. So let's try to bias the transistor to something larger than 20 milliamps. So how about 30 milliamps? And so that's what I did here in the simulation. Bias it to 30 milliamps and sure enough, we get a nice sinusoidal looking thing and there's no clipping. It's not horribly distorted or anything. If you look at the current, you see the current, it starts from roughly a DC level of 30 milliamps, and it goes roughly plus or minus uh, 20 milliamps from there. Not quite due to some uh, nonlinearities, but it's close enough. 
So uh, yeah, wait. basically, uh, you need to bias it to a higher current than you're trying to output, right? Exactly. Okay. And if, if you don't want any distortion on the output, there's really no way around that. Um, well, there, there's no way around that unless you add extra stuff, which we'll see. So we can, we can say a few things about this approach. So yes, it worked. However, there's some issues. One is what's the power that's being dissipated in the transistor and the emitter resistor? Well, basically what is, what is the power that's being dissipated that's not going into the load? And so in this case, we have a DC voltage source at five volts we have a DC current of 30 milliamps. So the product of the two is basically the DC power that's being dissipated within our circuit that's not going to the load. And if you take the product, that's 150 milliwatts, right? And if you look at the efficiency, which is just the output power divided by the DC power that's being burned, that comes out to 6.7%, which is pretty terrible, right? <laughs> So if you imagine you had, you know, you, you wanted to transmit at one watt or one kilowatt even, the 6.7% is not gonna cut it, right? I mean, if it, let's say it was 10%, right? We wanted to transmit one watt, that means we're burning, what? Um, uh, uh, 10 watts in our circuit. And that's pretty horrible. That's a lot of heat that you have to dissipate. So basically just increasing the bias current is not what we want to do. There's other things that happen at high bias currents. Um, for this particular transistor, the MMBTH10, the current gain of the transistor, transistor, which is beta, that tends to drop off as you get to higher and higher currents. So that means your input impedance will drop um, and that'll decrease the gain of the overall system and that's no good. It also tends to um, decrease gain at higher frequencies. So basically the performance of the circuit as frequency increases will do get worse and worse. And so the question is, can we do better? And of course we can do better. So let's look at what we can do. Uh, one solution uh, is to increase the load impedance from 50 ohms to let's say 200 ohms. And so with this higher load impedance, to get the same 10 milliwatts going into the load, we have a higher voltage swing. Right now it's two volts instead of one volt. And that means our current swing is halved from 20 milliamps to 10 milliamps. And right here, we'll worry about how to create the load impedance later. So to just assume that we've changed the 50 ohms to 200 ohms for now. And so that means by increasing this load impedance, we can have a lower current swing, and that means we can bias the transistor at a lower current. So in this case, uh, let's say we bias the transistor to 15 milliamps instead of the 30, right? So we, we cut the load current swing by 10, so let's cut the transistor current swing by 10. So that cuts our DC power dissipation by two. So instead of 150 milliwatts from before, now we're at 75. However, the efficiency is still 13.3%, which is still terrible. So can we do even better? Um, the answer is yes. And so instead of just arbitrarily choosing 200 ohms, let's try to find out what is the optimum load impedance that we can choose for this transistor uh, given you know, the five volt voltage source and all the, the output power we want and so on. So, um, I've stuck the schematic of the common collector amplifier on the top right, just for reference. And let's take a look at this plot on the left. So this is something that, you know, everybody who's taken the 115 series ends up being scared of. <laughs> but basically we're plotting the collector current on the vertical axis. On the horizontal axis, we have the collector to emitter voltage. 
and each of these different curves correspond to a different uh, VBE or equivalently a given uh, base current, right? And collector current is equal to the base current times the current gain of the transistor beta, right? Uh, assuming you're inside this linear region here, the forward active region. So uh, we bias the transistor to some point. And so I, I put that point here in green, just as an example. And so that means that the VCC, the collector to emitter voltage of the transistor will be VCC minus the VE, the emitter voltage. And that's what this point here is, right? And so in order to stay in this uh, forward active region, right, we need VCC to be larger than this VCE set this quantity right here. Otherwise we enter the saturation region and that's where we get no gain, no amplification. And we don't wanna do that. And the maximum that the VCC can be is uh, VCC, right? That means that there is basically no current going into the emitter resistor. The transistor is almost off and almost all the voltage is being dropped across the transistor itself. So there's basically two limits that VCC can be at. And when we vary the input, we're basically gonna move uh, left and right on this horizontal axis. And we're also gonna move up and down uh, the vertical axis, the current, right? So we increase the input voltage, we're gonna increase current and we're gonna decrease the VCE because more voltage is being dropped across the resistor. So the question is, uh, what is the optimal resistor we can choose such that we get maximum voltage swing and maximum current swing at the same time, right? That means we get as much power as possible out of the transistor for a given bias point. Right, the bias point determines how much power we're dissipating and the maximum current and voltage swing determines how much power is going to the load. So the answer is you draw a line starting from VCC at the bottom here and you go up to, you, you intersect the uh, green dot here, the bias point, and you keep going until you hit the saturation region. And that means that as we vary VCE, uh, we're gonna move along this line up and down and we can get all the way up to VCC, we can get all the way down to VCE set and current can go from zero all the way, all the way up to this point right here, whatever that might be. Well, we know exactly what it is. It's twice of this current here. So uh, any, any questions on that? Okay. So um, now the question is what resistor corresponds to this line? And I'm gonna make a couple assumptions here. So the first assumption I'm gonna make is that VCE sat is zero. And that's clearly not true but it's an approximation of uh, you know, the transistor conditions. If we assume that VCC is large enough, uh, VCE set, you know, that's a roughly 0.2 volts. Um, it can be made negligible compared to VCC. So if we assume that's zero, and the other thing we're gonna assume is VE is equal to VCC over two. So this point here, it's just VCC over two. That's saying that we're biasing the transistor such that its emitter is halfway between VCC and ground. That's what we did before, right? It's at 2.5 volts. And if we do that, and we look at the slope of this line, that corresponds to the, uh, the load voltage, right? Basically the emitter resistor in parallel with the load resistor. 
um, specifically the you know the slope of this line is equal to minus one over re in parallel with rl right because you know you do i over v you get conductance you have to take the reciprocal to get the resistance so the optimum load resistor is based oops let's go back the optimum load resistor is the slope of this line what is the slope well it's rise over run right the the rise let's let's go from this point here to this point here the rise is the you know this uh, right here is the DC collector current. And this right here is VCC over two. So that means the optimum load resistor is just VCC over two divided by IC. And if we look at the output power, we just do the uh, a voltage swing divide, uh, times the current swing divided by two, right? You know, VI over two. And the voltage swing is just VCC over two. The current swing is IC. So you get VCC times IC over four. And the DC power that's being dissipated in the transistor, as well as the emitter resistor, is VCC times IC, right? That, that's important. Um, and if you take the ratio of the output power to the DC power, that's 25%. So that means the maximum efficiency that we can achieve with this common collector amplifier design is 25%. Any, any questions about that? If, if you need clarification on anything, just ask. All right. So uh, let's try to redesign our amplifier from before using these, you know, the optimum load resistance in order to maximize the efficiency. Well, we know that the output amplitude is going to be 2.5 volts. And remember, we wanted a 10 milliwatt output power. So you just do the same thing we did before, right? The output power is one half V times I. So in this case, V is 2.5 volts. P is uh, 10 milliwatts. So we just do you know, P times two over V to get I. In this case, it comes out to eight milliamps. So, that means if we bias the transistor at eight milliamps and we have the 2.5 volt voltage swing, the optimum resistor comes out to 313 ohms, which is you know close to the 200 ohms we had before, but larger, right? And that means that our DC power dissipation, is just VCC times IC, which is 40 milliwatts. That gives us the 25% efficiency that's basically what we said before, right? Because we have 10 milliwatts going to the load divided by 40 going, being dissipated in the transistor and the resistor. That comes out to 25%. So again, this is not great, but it's much better than the 6% the and the 13% we had before. And we, uh, as we asked before, can we do better? And the answer is yes. And so here's where we get into the the typical class A power amplifier used in RF systems. So any, any questions up till now? Okay, so now on to the class A power amplifier. Um, so class A, it, when we're talking RF class A, we're almost always using a common collector amplifier, not a common, sorry, common emitter amplifier, not a common collector amplifier. 
And uh, there's kind of a couple reasons why, but let's take a look at this circuit first. So from a typical common, collect, common emitter amplifier, we usually have a resistor uh, at the collector. And you know we have the degeneration resistor at the emitter, but that's bypassed by a capacitor to increase the gain. Um, so assuming we got rid of this inductor, it would just be your standard common emitter amplifier. But we have the inductor, and so things change slightly. So the first thing to notice is an inductor is a short at DC. So that means the collector voltage at DC is going to be 5 volts, not um, something below 5 volts, right? And one of the nice things, one of the nice advantages there is that means we can bias the transistor as high as we want and we won't enter the saturation region, you know, assuming we got rid of this resistor here and just shorted the emitter to ground. We could keep increasing the collector current bias and the transistor wouldn't enter saturation. And that was a problem we had uh, before with, with common emitter amplifiers where we just had the resistor at the collector. If the current came too high, then the transistor would saturate. But here we don't have that problem. Uh, the other thing is that we're going to choose the inductance of this inductor such that it's reactance at our frequencies of interest, so in this case 27 megahertz, uh, is fairly high. So kind of the opposite to these capacitors here, right? So remember we, choose, we chose these AC coupling capacitors such that their values were small at frequencies of interest. Here we're choosing the inductor such that its uh, reactance is large. And so we call this type of inductor an RF choke or RFC, you might see often, uh, right here, RFC. Um, and so what does that do? Well, we have this load here, the RL, that's AC coupled to the collector. And so that means this load in parallel with this inductor, uh, because the inductor we're saying has a large reactance, it's basically just this resistor that that's, uh, has any important role here. But the, the key here is that, remember that this collector is sitting at five volts of DC, and when we apply some AC signal to the base, that's going to move the collector current up and down. And remember that the voltage across an inductor, well, I guess we can start, uh, uh, yeah, voltage across an inductor is LDIDT, oops. L D I D T. Excuse me. Yes. So if I, I is going to be sinusoidal, right? Because the base voltage is, is sinusoidal and the base voltage controls the collector current. So I will be sinusoidal. And the derivative of sinusoid is another sinusoid, except you shift the phase by 90 degrees and sometimes you flip the sign. Um, and then multiply it by L. And what that's saying is that V, this can be positive or negative. So what is the voltage at the collector? Well, it's just uh, this five volts minus the inductor voltage. And five volts minus this quantity that can be positive or negative. Well, that's just, something that goes up and down above and below five volts, right? So that means the collector voltage can actually increase above five volts as well as go below five volts. And that's something we did not see before when we just had the resistive load there. So that's, that's something that's very unique to this, uh, having this inductor here. Um, also, unlike the common collector amplifier we had before, this guy provides voltage gain, um, which can be pretty useful, right? That means we can input a small power signal instead of a large signal, and we could still get a high power signal on the output. And by high power, I mean high voltage and current at the same time. 
So any questions there? Okay, so the, then the question is what is limiting the voltage at the collector? Well, there's kind of two things. One is the, the collector voltage can only go so low until this uh, transistor enters the saturation region. So the emitter is gonna be sitting at some DC voltage. And because we have this capacitor here, this DC voltage is not really gonna change much. So that means that the, if we call this VE, that means that the collector voltage must be greater than uh, VE plus VCE set in order to stay in the linear, not the linear, sorry, the forward active region. And if we go below that, then we saturate and that's when your signal gets really distorted because the gain drops off rapidly. Now, how high can this uh, voltage go? Well, that's kind of limited by the transistor itself. You know, what, what is the VCE breakdown voltage? Um, that's basically when you destroy your transistor. <laughs> we don't want to do that. So that those are kind of the two limits there. Okay, so let's go back to this load line analysis thing. And I've modified the x-axis a little. So before we bias the emitter voltage such that it was halfway between VCC and grand. Here, what we're doing is we're gonna bias, we're gonna assume that the emitter is basically grounded, right? Because if I go back here, you want this VE voltage to be as small as possible in order to maximize the swing of VC. You know, how low and how high can it go? Well. The lower limit is bounded by VE. Well, if you make VE smaller, that means VE can go even lower. So let's assume that VE is zero. And of course we can't do that because then our DC bias gets messed up. But if we assume, if we ignore that for now, let's just assume that VE is zero. And I'm also gonna assume that VCE sat is zero like we did before. Um, so, VCE is basically going to sit at VCC, because remember the collector voltage is sitting at VCC, the emitter voltage is sitting at zero. So VCE is just going to be VCC minus zero, which is VCC. And we said before that uh, the collector voltage can go above the VCC and it can also go below. And we know it can only go as low as the emitter voltage essentially, so zero volts. And if we keep our signal symmetric above and below VCC, that means that the collector voltage can go as low as zero volts, really VCE sat volts, but we're assuming that's zero. And it can go as high as two VCC, right? So it can go plus or minus VCC around VCC itself. And as before, we can draw this blue line that's essentially representing the linear resistor. And we do the same analysis as before. So we draw a line from the maximum collector voltage all the way up to the saturation region. And we're assuming that the saturation region is zero. So this would really continue all the way up here until you get to the vertical axis. And we can then calculate the slope of this line. And so what's the slope? Well, the height as before, this is just IC, the collector bias current. And this over here is VCC. So the slope is gonna be IC over VC or minus IC over VC. Then we take the reciprocal, add a minus sign to get the re the load resistance, and that comes out to VCC over IC. So that means the output power, the maximum output power we can get from this device is gonna be VCC times IC over two. Um, and then the DC is the same as before, it's just VCC times IC, 
And if you take the ratio of the output power to the DC power, it's 50%. And that's a nice two times improvement over uh, the common collector amplifier. And you know, 50% is not as bad as 25%. It's way better than 6%. It's still not great, but we're gonna, but that's the, this is the theoretical maximum efficiency you can get from a class A amplifier. And of course, in practice, you never achieve the 50%. Why? Because first of all, we have this assumption here. We assume that VCE sat was zero. In reality, it's not. And that means that we can't go all the way down to zero volts on the collector. And so that limits the voltage swing and therefore limits how much power you can get out for a given uh, DC power. Um, there's also losses in the transistor itself. You know, every transistor has some finite resistance to each of the terminals. Uh, there's also parasitics and all of that contribute to lowering this efficiency from the 50%. So you never get 50 in reality. Well, given all of that, let's try designing one of these and see what happens. So these are C's five volts as before. And so that means these, the voltage uh, amplitude across the load is gonna be five volts, you know, plus or minus five volts. Um, however, let's assume that it's going to be four volts and that's going to account for the saturation of voltage of the transistor and also the uh, finite voltage drop across this resistor here. But then remember that this resistor is just used for DC biasing purposes. It's not for gain or anything. So if we assume there's four, four volts amplitude across the load, um, in order to achieve 10 milliwatts, we need a five milliamp current amplitude. So uh, in order to give us some more margin, let's bias the transistor at six milliamps. And if we use the equation from before, the optimum load resistance is just the, basically the voltage swing, four volts, divided by the current swing is five milliamps, and that's 800 ohms, right? So that means the uh, DC power number is just VCC times IC, so that's five volts times six milliamps, that gets us 30 milliwatts, and so that means the efficiency of this amplifier is 10 milliwatts over 30 milliwatts, which is 33.3%, you know, a third of 100%. And again, that's better than what we had before and still not great, but it's kind of what, what you can hope to achieve with a class A amplifier. You can get higher, uh, definitely, but uh, you, you have to add a little bit more complexity you also end up reducing these margins here that we've made. And then you're not really taking into account any uh, you know, variations of the device or changes in biases. And that'll end up ruining your day. So this is what the voltage and current waveforms look like across the load. So the bottom is voltage, the top is current. And you see it's pretty nonlinear, right? It doesn't look perfectly sinusoidal. Um, so uh, there's solutions to that. One solution is just to filter the output and basically get rid of any harmonics. And that'll leave you with a nice sinusoid. Uh, the other is to lower the efficiency of the amplifier by biasing it at a higher current. And uh, in order to get the same amount of output power, you would just lower the input amplitude and that'll bring you to a more linear region of the transistor. But of course, you're sacrificing the efficiency by doing so. Um, one, one of the nice things about this amplifier, though, is that it has a lot of gain. And so that means the input amplitude can be small. In this case, it's 35 millivolts amplitude, which is way smaller than the output. So that's a nice property. So is there any questions about this so far? No questions. Question. How do you actually change the load resistance? Like if you're 
putting this into an antenna. An antenna is just 50. If you wait two slides, we'll get to it. Awesome. <laughs> All right. So before getting to that, I wanted to talk a little bit about other classes of power amplifiers. So you've probably heard of class B and class AB amplifiers. Um, in the audio region, uh, often you see, you know, like a push pull configuration, you know, something like this. You know, this would be an NPN, and the top one would be, a, I'm sorry, the bottom one would be a PNP transistor. And your output would be right here. You know, that might be your speaker or something. And this might be either a class B or a class AB amplifier. And you can do that at RF frequencies. However, uh, th these are basically two common collector amplifiers. And as we said before, the maximum efficiency you can get out of this is 25%. Um, so, well, okay. Uh, um, if you assume these were class A amplifiers, then yeah, it would be 25%. But because this is a class B or a class A B amplifier, uh, you can end up getting higher. Um, but the fact that these are common collector amplifiers means you're not getting the highest uh, efficiency possible. But at RF frequencies, what is commonly done with a class B or class AB amplifier is basically what you're doing is instead of outputting um, the entire uh, voltage waveform, you're basically clipping the net, uh, part of it. So, you know, the ideal voltage output waveform would be some sinusoid. And if this was a class uh, B amplifier, the output waveform would, would get clipped at the negative half, and then you'd only see the positive half. And the reason you can get away with that is you have a filter on the output of a class uh, B amplifier. And what you're doing is you're, you're filtering the harmonics that are generated as a result of clipping the output. So, uh, you know, if you take the Fourier series of this, you'll get some power at the fundamental, and you also get powers at the power at the second harmonic and the third harmonic and so on. And you just want to filter out all of this, then you're, you'll be left with a fundamental, and that will just be the perfect sinusoid. Um, so you can do that. And the way you do that, it's pretty simple. Um, so if we just take our common collector amplifier from before with the, you know, the class A amplifier, you still have the inductor and everything. And you have your AC coupled load. And I'm, I'm ignoring the DC bias for now. But, and you'll have your, uh, uh, your signal source here. But the key is that I see the DC collector current is zero. So that means the transistor will turn on for the positive portion of the cycle. And then once it gets to zero, it'll turn off and then the negative portion will just be clipped off. And that's basically what we had um, at the beginning of, with the common collector amplifier that clipped off the negative portion of the cycle. And the reason we can get away with it here, and we could have gotten away with it there, is that we don't directly connect the resistor up Instead, we have some sort of filter. Um, you know, it might be a low pass filter or a band pass filter. And then we have the resistor, the load. And so this filter is the key uh, to making this work. At audio frequencies, you would use the other transistor to conduct for the other portion of the cycle. And you know, if you know your audio stuff, you might have a crossover region, you know, crossover distortion, um, but that's not too important here. The key is that by biasing the transistor 
so that it's off for the negative portion of the cycle, what you're doing is that you're decreasing the DC power dissipation in the transistor and therefore increasing the efficiency. What you're not doing is you're not increasing the maximum output power. It's actually that happens to be the same output power that you can achieve, but you are increasing the efficiency. So any, any questions there? Okay. Um, and the difference between class B and class AB is that class AB, um, you'll bias the transistor so that it's slightly on, um, and then it'll conduct for part of the negative cycle, but not the entire negative cycle. So that, that's the only difference between the two. Now class C is similar to class B and AB. The difference with class B and C is that you're biasing the transistor is biased so that it's off, but you go even farther. You bias the base voltage of the transistor such that it's more negative than the most positive swing of the AC signal. So what I mean by that, let me clean this up a little. Um, if the input, you know, Vn, looks like this and say this is B naught and this is minus B naught. What you'll do is you'll set the oops, minus B naught, you'll set the DC base to emitter voltage. Or I guess not base to emitter, but just base voltage. You'll set this equal to uh, or let me put it this way. Uh, VB is greater than V naught. Oops, wrong way. <laughs> ah. Not greater than, less than. V naught plus uh, VDE on. So I think I got this wrong. Um, we want it to be less than, um, yeah, I got the order wrong here. So this would be VBE on minus D naught. So what this is saying is that you have your V in that's going you know, up to V naught and down to minus V naught. And so that's above and below this VBE on. And this condition is saying that the transistor will only turn on for only a portion of the, of the positive part of the cycle. So basically for class B, we're saying it's only on for half the cycle. Class AB is saying it's only on for somewhere between half the cycle and a full cycle. Class C is saying that the transistor is only on for less than half a cycle. So the, the basically the, uh, collector current will end up looking like this. You'll have a little blip and then zero, and then a little blip and then zero, and then that repeats. And then you do a whole filtering operation and that'll get you back the actual sinusoid, right? Um, but the, the advantage here is that the transistor is on for barely a small portion of the cycle and that increases the efficiency even more. You know, the disadvantage though, is that the, the maximum amount of output power you can get out of this is smaller, uh, the gain smaller. And uh, so that, that's the disadvantage. Now there's other types, there's the class D amplifier. You might see this used pretty often in audio frequencies. The problem is as you increase the frequency, um, you know, ideally these guys have 100% efficiency, 
as you increase efficiency, sorry, if, if you increase frequency, the efficiency of the class D amplifier ends up dropping and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. That's just how it works. Um, the, the problem really is a transistor has some parasitic capacitance and as you switch on and off the transistor, um, you end up charging and discharging that capacitance and that charging and discharging uh, ends up burning power and you can't do anything about it. So that's why you don't really see them used at high frequencies. And the last one I'll mention is the class E and class F amplifier. And these are kind of interesting. So theoretically they can approach 100% efficiency. Now, of course they never actually get there, but they can get fairly close. Now you might see 70% efficiency, you might see 80%. And that's very high for RF amplifiers. Um, so the way they work is that it's, they're basically focused on this filter right here. What they do is that they terminate the harmonics of your fundamental frequency in a certain way in order to kind of shape how the voltage waveform looks like. And by shaping the voltage waveform appropriately, you can minimize how much power is being dissipated in the transistor itself. And therefore, you know, all the power ends up going to the load instead of the transistor. And that's how they're able to approach 100% efficiency. It's kind of an interesting topic. I can talk about it later if you want. So back to the question we had before, the impedance transformation. So basically we replace the 50 ohm load with something that's more optimal and we never really justified how we can do that. You know, the antenna is just not gonna magically change from 50 ohms to some other impedance. So the easiest solution is to just use a transformer. I'm sure you learned about that in EE10 or so on. And you know, you have your transformer, it has a turn ratio N1 and N2 primary, secondary. And if, you, if you're looking into the primary and you have a, a load of ZL, the effective impedance you're gonna see is N1 over N2 squared times ZL. So if you choose N1 and N2 appropriately, you can basically change ZL to whatever you want. And the interesting thing here is that the, the transformer itself is lossless. There's no power dissipation in the transformer or at least an ideal transformer. And that means that, uh, you know, there, there's no harm really in adding this transformer. There's nothing, there's no efficiency loss in converting this load to something that's more optimal. And the way that happens is, you know, you have some sort of voltage and current, you know, some voltage across the primary and some current going into it. And the turn ratios work out such that, um, uh, you know, if you transform this load from 50 ohms to 800 ohms, you'll have a high voltage amplitude on the primary and a low voltage amplitude on the secondary. But at the same time, you'll have a low current amplitude on the primary and a high current amplitude on the secondary. So the power, you know, conservation is met there. And so that's how that works. Now, of course, transformers aren't always practical, especially at high frequencies. And sometimes you do use them. And, you know, especially at microwave frequencies, there's uh, some clever techniques you can use with microstrip and transmission lines to basically act as a transformer. Um, and, uh, you know, the frequencies we're working at, we can literally just use a transformer, say wrap wire around a, a ferrite core, for example, and it'll be a transformer. But there's other techniques you can use. And so one of them is called an L impedance matching network. And so what I did is I took the original common emitter class A amplifier we had before, and except now instead of that 800 ohm load, I replaced it with an actual 50 ohm load and also added these two components here. So it's a capacitor and an inductor. And the effect of these two components is that they make the effective impedance looking into here, 800 ohms, specifically at 27 megahertz. 
So this only works at a single frequency. Um, of course, it works okay within a certain bandwidth around that frequency, but if you go uh, far away from 27 megahertz, it won't work at all. Um, and uh, this is a very useful technique, of course. And basically what it's allowing you to do is suck away more energy or more power from your amplifier without it entering the saturation region or turning off or whatever. Um, the key here is that these components are reactive, so they're not, they don't dissipate any power, except for any parasitic losses. Um, and this works both ways. You can transform a resistance to a higher resistance. You can also transform it to a lower resistance if you need to. And so the question is, how do we choose these values? Well, it's not too hard to just go through the math. Right, it, this is basically an EE10 problem, right? You have some, <laughs> you have some network. You want to look, know what's the impedance looking into it, and you just need to choose these two uh, components such that you achieve that impedance. That's easy enough to do. It's just a lot of arithmetic. Um, I'll, I'll note that when you're doing it, what you want to do is you set the real part of the impedance to look like 50 ohms. You set the imaginary part to look like zero. In that there's your two equations, you have two unknowns, and you just solve. So that's easy enough. Just takes time. There's more, there's a more intuitive way to go about it though. So here I've redrawn the, the matching network. So you have the capacitor, you have the inductor, you have the load resistance, and you also have um, I call this RS, the source resistance in a sense is the RS is basically what we want the impedance looking into this network to look like. So how do we choose? So the, the known values here is RS and RL. And you wanna choose C and L to uh, achieve uh, this uh, impedance match. So what, what we ultimately wanna to try to do is if we treat this part as one network, and this part is another network. You see we have parallel RC, series LC. Well, each of these has a quality factor. And what we'll try to do is make the quality factors of these two equal. Um, but of course we have to choose a quality factor. And if you go through the math, the correct choice is this right here. So you just take the ratio of the two resistances, you subtract one and you take the square root. So remember before we had 800 ohms and 50 ohms. So you just do 800 over 50, you get, uh, what is that? Um, the math is failing me. Uh, 80 over five, 16, yeah, you're right. So 16 minus one is 15, square root of 15 is like 3.8 or something something around there. It was it 80 over five or 800 over five? 800 over 50. Okay, so same, cool. Yeah. Um, so that's the Q. And if you remember the equations from before, from a few lectures ago, if we have a parallel RC, um, the Q is equal to uh, two pi, the frequency times RC. And then if you have a series LC, this is just two pi FL over R. And if you solve for L and C, you get this. And the assumption we made here is that RS is greater than RL. Can I write that here? Um, but if it was the other way around, you would just swap the position of RL and RS and it would, it would come out the same way. Um, you can also use an inductor in place of this capacitor and then a capacitor in place of this inductor. And if you perform a similar operation, you would get similarly, similar equations and it would work out just fine. Uh, but the key thing here is that this only works at a single frequency. And that's why we have this frequency term 
in these equations. But the other advantage of this approach is you'll notice that this kind of looks like a low pass filter, right? Like an LC low pass filter. And that's exactly what it does. So what this ends up doing is filtering out the some of the higher harmonics uh, in the output. And so that makes the output look more sinusoidal. And that's a good thing, usually. Any, any questions there? No, OK. So we're almost done here. So I wrote, I wrote a lot of things here. And I'm just going to take a brief look over them. So here's some other considerations you can make when we talk power amplifiers. So when we define efficiency, I defined it as the output power divided by the DC power dissipated in the amplifier. And there's another metric called power added efficiency. And this is one that you'll commonly see when you use uh, RF amplifiers, microwave amplifiers. What uh, PAE, power added efficiency, what that's doing is that it's taking into account the gain of the amplifier. So basically an amplifier, it can provide a, um, a high output power, but that's no use if you have to input a high input power to get that high output power, right? Like if the gain of your amplifier is zero dB, you have to input the same amount of power for a given to get the maximum output power, and then the amplifier is just useless. That would make your efficiency zero, essentially, in terms of power added efficiency. So the, the way it's defined is you do the output power minus the input power divided by the DC power. And so you'll see that this quantity is always less than our the, the way we previously defined efficiency but it's usually more important, right? Because here we're taking into account the input power. Um, if the gain is high enough, then P out minus P in is uh, very close to P out. And then it just approaches P out over PDC, which is our previous definition. Um, the second thing is amplifier linearity. So if you were to plot, um, output power versus input power. Ideally, this would be linear, right? Just a line. Oops, let's be out. So the ideal case, and this is a uh, uh, dB scale. So ideally, it's just a line, right? So P out uh, over P in, is, um, in dB is constant. But at some point, the power will start compressing, or the gain will start compressing, and you just won't get any more output power. And that's a property of every single amplifier out there. Um, the, the exact shape of this will vary depending on the amplifier, but at some point it will compress. And if you're operating in this region right here, that means that the uh, you basically get a lot of distortion in the output, right? So you know you might if if you go all the way to the right here, you'll basically be clipping your signal and won't be sinusoidal anymore. Uh, but if you're near this threshold, there'll just be a little bit of distortion. But the problem is remember, we wanted to operate the amplifier basically close to the voltage and current limits of the amplifier. And that means we're operating close to this compression region right here in order to get, maximize the efficiency. So we basically have no choice but to operate near here. So that's kind of a problem, right? <laughs> um, and there's a few terms that can characterize how this amplifier behaves near this compression point. So you might see the P1dB, uh, that, that is the point at which the gain of the amplifier drops by one dB. 
Uh, there's also something called third order intermodulation disorder, uh, distortion. Um, and that, that's kind of a more complicated topic, but basically just an, a type of distortion that occurs to the signal. And that's characterized by something called the IP3 or the uh, you know, third order intermodulation product, but I, I won't go into that. Um, there's something called AM to PM distortion. This is kind of interesting. So AM, that's amplitude modulation, PM is phase modulation. And so what happens, and this is just one way of causing it, but if you, if you have some amplitude modulation on your signal, um, that means that the, uh, the uh, input and output power of the power amplifier is going to be increasing and decreasing over time. And that means the power dissipated in the transistor will be increasing and decreasing over time. And when a transistor increases in temperature, or uh, power dissipation increases, that'll increase the temperature of the transistor itself. And when you increase device temperature, that's gonna change device characteristics. So that might change parasitic capacitances, might change the gain or something. And so what, what ends up happening is that, you know, parasitics can cause a phase shift between the input and the output. And if those parasitics change, that can cause a phase modulation as a result of the amplitude modulation. And that's no good. <laughs> Don't want that. But that, that's just something that can happen if it, that can happen. Um, so the, the conclusion of this big bullet point here is that nonlinearities as well as time variances in the amplifier are gonna ruin your day. All right, next thing I have listed here is something called digital pre-distortion. And so what this is doing is in the digital domain, if we characterize how the amplifier distorts a signal, we can basically uh, run our output signal before it goes to the amplifier. We can run it through the inverse of that distortion function. And when it gets distorted, we'll get the actual intended signal at the output. And this, this only works to a certain extent. Uh, you know, if, if, basically, if you're basically clipping you know, most of the signal, there's really not much you can do. But if you're inside this region where you're not fully clipping the signal, um, it's possible to correct for any distortion that happens. Um, the last thing I have listed here is other ways to improve efficiency beyond um, just changing amplifier classes and so on. So one of them is called envelope tracking. And the way this works, remember that the DC power dissipated in the device was for a class A amplifier was VCC times IC. And the output power was VCC over IC. I'm sorry, not, not VCC over IC. It was um, uh, VCC times IC over two. And uh, so where, where was I going with this? Right, envelope tracking. So this is the output power Here's the power dissipation in the trans in the amplifier. But if we have say amplitude modulation going on, like in the intentional amplitude modulation, then that means that the output power we want will go up and down with the modulation. And what we can do is if we vary VCC as a function of that modulation, we can basically have VCC track the modulation and always operate in this most efficient uh, portion of the load line uh, at all times. And so that means our DC power supply will have to you know, go up and down and track that amplitude modulation. So that's one technique. Another technique is called load modulation. And you, you can combine all of these by the way, but load modulation is basically we're changing the load resistance, the effective load resistance uh, to also match that amplitude modulation 
And that's basically doing the same thing. We're trying to always stay in the most efficient portion of the load line at all times in order to maximize efficiency. Um, and so the way you do that is you basically have a kind of a variable transformer that transforms your load impedance to be variable optimum impedance. And there's different ways of doing that. Um, and then the last one I have listed here is a, a Doherty amplifier. And that's kind of cool. The way it works is you have two amplifiers. One is for low power and the other one is for high power. So, you know, simple block diagram might look like this. You have one amplifier, you have another amplifier, you have your uh, input signal and it goes to both. And then there's some magical network here that I, I won't go into. And that goes to your, your load. And so your, your input signal might look like this. You know, you have your, let's say you have some sort of amplitude modulation thing going on. And so on. But what, what, what's happening here is that, that let's say call this amplifier one and amplifier two. Amplifier one will be amplifying you know, this, the entire thing. The amplifier two will only be active during these high peaks right here. So it'll only be amplifying this and this and this and this. And when you combine the two, you get your original signal amplified if you do things correctly. Um, but the key is that uh, the low power amplifier uses much less power than the high power amplifier. So by minimizing the amount of time that the low, the high power amplifier is on, you're increasing the efficiency of the overall system. So that's all I have for today. It's run well over an hour. So anybody have any questions? Guess not, so we'll stop the recording.